seriously on Real Vision versus the Defiant, Avenging Angel Camilla Russo got tough on the haters as she refused to rule out a return to full combat word jesting. And in the stunning finale, the bespectacled oracle of 80s pop, surfing pitch perfectly on the sweet chaos of future finance, Ash Bennington revealed he would, in his words, be watching the markets. And then there's me. Back to the vanilla version of myself after last week's pathetic flirtation with Metaverse Metamorphosis. My only meaningful contribution to the conversation today, a well-grooved English accent and a promise to not split the infinitive. So Bitcoin was moving positively again this week. There's been some positive catalysts that we've seen. There was the India CBDC news. There's been a bunch of other things. Ash, has there been anything on your radar particularly to take note of that's been moving the market this way? Well, you know, this is just the traditional pattern. We're trading around 44,000 here as we record this show uh, on uh, Wednesday morning. Uh, the reality is this is the pattern of Bitcoin. We see these sell-offs. We see anxiety uh, in the market based on, uh, you know, based on price action. And then we see baseline recovery. And we're headed back in that direction again. There are a series of catalysts that we could talk about. Uh, you mentioned one, India, uh, Russia. There are a couple of data points we could pick off. But reality, check, this seems to be the way that the asset trades. It, it is, but there also seems to be a growing groundswell of news and more kind of traditional players moving. We've got governments moving in various countries. There just seems to be this, this feeling that everything is moving towards a more mainstream debate and becoming more politicized. And Cammy, there, there was a story that we picked up in The Defiant, which is about um, US lawmakers introducing a bill to stop the IRS from taxing crypto transactions. And there was more news on those who were staking as well. Could you pick up some of that? Yeah, so the there's a bill to stop the IRS from, from taxing crypto transactions under $200. Uh, who knows whether that will pass, but um, it's, it's this push to uh, make crypto easier to use in the mainstream um, by avoiding the, the uh, taxation for like small transactions. It would obviously be easier to use crypto as a, a means of exchange um and and that should kind of spur more more activity so i think you're right um ash that it's it's just really hard to pin these market moves on any single news um i to be honest i don't think it was the india cbdc i don't think it was russia i don't think it was this us bill um i think it is just a very volatile asset um and it it just you know it 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 moves with um, obviously, you know, people kind of becoming interested in it, and maybe there's some uh, flows from big funds that they just kind of the past couple of weeks decided to uh, finally get into Bitcoin. Maybe it's uh, some in other institutional players. Who knows? I think it it kind of um, when when we're outside of these kind of big broad market movements. Uh, that makes uh, Bitcoin and, and crypto kind of pick up correlation with the broader markets um, in like the upside or the downside. And, and we're back to these kind of like more lateral moves Th is when we see crypto kind of start to decouple from, from stocks and from other risk assets. And that's what we're seeing now. It's kind of like dancing to its, to its own rhythm. Yeah, I think Cammy hit it uh, perfectly right there. Uh, it, it, this is part of a broader theme, though, I would say, about the maturation uh, of the regulatory and legislative process. Look, I would say, though, there are going to be ups and downs in this. Uh, we're going to see starts and then false starts and backsliding. Uh, but the reality, the recognition uh, that transactions under $200, for example, as Cammy points out, whether or not that bill uh, passes, uh, probably are not uh, things that we should be thinking of the way that we think of, for example, stock trades uh, and staking. Obviously, this is something that's been a question that's been floating around for some time now. Um, but the idea that staking may not be taxed in the same way uh, as you would a traditional financial transaction probably makes a lot of sense and can be good for the industry. I think this is part of a, a broader reconciliation of trying to understand how existing securities, tax laws, uh, and other regulatory domains fit into crypto. Because when you think about it, what's happened is we put this framework on crypto, uh, we meaning uh, Western nations in particular, uh, this framework was imposed from the outside based on things that people already knew. Securities legislation, uh, things, for example, uh, taxing capital gains, these kinds, of, uh, these kinds of schemas were imposed where perhaps they don't really fit. And we're in this long process now of sorting that out, figuring out what the most appropriate regulations are. And I think it's going to take some time. Well, the, the Russian news is interesting because Russia has traditionally come out fairly strongly against 
cryptocurrencies. And I, there was an article I was reading from just 20 days ago where Russian central bank was proposing banning the use of money of cryptocurrencies on Russian territory. And then today, the latest news is that Russia may well soon become the latest current country to recognize cryptocurrency as a form of currency. And it'll be heavily regulated, of course. But I mean, this is a massive turnaround for a country that was vehemently against it. And it's like, well, if Russia, then who's next? I guess that's the question. Yeah, again, I guess it comes back to sort of uh, the, the framework I was just applying extremely, extremely early in this space. Uh, there are going to be ups, there are going to be downs, there are going to be uh, reversions, there are going to be about faces, uh, and it's, it's going to be a bumpy ride. But I think uh, I'm an optimist. I think we're going to get there. I think what we're seeing now is governments, uh, legislators, uh, and regulators trying to struggle with how to bring this uh, into a framework that fits into the broader social, financial, economic sphere uh, of of the nation state. And that's a long process. Cami, do you remember the, the Uniswap grant that was given to the committee that was lobbying Congress for, for better regulation? Do you, do you know what's happened to that one? Um, what's happened to the grant? No, I, I don't know the latest on that. Uh, were there kind of further developments? I, to be honest with you, I've lost track of it. But the reason I bring it up is because I had a conversation last night with a, a figure who would be well known if I named him, but I, I promise not to name him at this point, but extremely prominent um, in US politics, who is putting together a group to lobby for, for more um, sensible regulation. And, and the point he was making to me last night was, Democrats tend to be against crypto, Republicans tend to be for it. It's a partisan issue at the moment. What he was trying to do was say, well, listen, it shouldn't be a partisan issue. It should be bipartisan. It should be for everybody. And if we can remove that piece of the politics from it, what he was telling me as well was that really, at the moment, there's about 24 key decision makers that you have to reach and get on your side. And he said, it may seem like Congress is completely stuffed up and constipated and can't do anything. But actually, if you target those people correctly and talk to them in with sensible language, things actually could happen. It's not this big black box. It's just some personal relationships, a Rolodex, and then some meaningful conversations, which I thought was kind of encouraging, actually. Um, but Ash, I mean, I know you, you, you're slightly, you're not exactly the most optimistic about the congressional process. Well, you know, I just think it's going to take time. I think it's going to be a long road to get there. And you're right. Unfortunately, this has become a partisan issue. But I will add sort of one uh, silver lining on that gray cloud, which is if you talk to folks uh, who consider themselves progressive, uh, people on the left, if you talk to people under 30, there's a great deal more openness uh, to digital assets, to cryptocurrency, to Bitcoin uh, than you see, for example, uh, with uh, the older demographic. So while I think on the surface, it certainly appears like kind of everything else in the United States and the UK and uh, many Western democracies like a hyper partisan issue, I think when you look uh, beneath the surface of the demography, uh, there's just a broad sense among younger people, people in their 20s, uh, that this is a technology that they want to be a part of their lives. Well, one of the really fascinating stories that we covered from last week revolved around the bailout of the Solana wormhole bridge. And if you don't know what a wormhole bridge is, it probably makes no sense at all. But this is a piece of infrastructure that allows value to transfer from Ethereum to one of the biggest layer one chains at the moment, Solana. And someone took $320 million worth of value out of it. But then Jump Trading came in and put it back, which is just remarkable. Cami, what's your take on this one? Um, well, I mean, th there are different um, aspects to highlight. Like one is this, uh, the risk of this multi-chain world. Um, so what we've seen is there have been a uh, flurry of new layer one blockchains emerge to satisfy the demand for block space. Um, people are wanting to transact and to use decentralized applications. Um, Ethereum has become expensive. So other layer ones like, like Solana, like Avalanche and so on have emerged to satisfy that demand. And um, there are uh, these connectors between uh, blockchains uh, which allow people to move assets uh, that are native to Ethereum onto um, uh, blockchains like uh, like Solana or or other other layer ones, um, and Wormhole is one of these bridges. 
Vitalik actually made uh, the creator of Ethereum made um, a point that he thinks that the future will be uh, multi-chain, like there there will be many different chains, but he doesn't think it will be cross-chain. Uh, so he thinks that there will be uh, many different use cases uh, being built on top of different blockchains, but he doesn't think it will be safe enough to transact across these chains. And he made this post and a few days later, this hack happened where uh, somebody was able to extract uh, 120,000 uh, worth of ETH, which was $320 million at the time. Um, kind of like proving this point that um, these cross-chain bridges are, uh, are very risky. So um, I think that may kind of put a dent into this vision that we'll have this like multi-chain world with all of this, like all assets interconnecting between blockchains and people will be able to transact on decentralized applications without even caring what the chains are beneath. Um, like there's been kind of this consensus that this world is coming, but now maybe kind of after this, uh, you'll have, people will start to have second thoughts on, on whether this is viable or, or whether this is a risk they'd want to take. So, I mean, that is one, one take. Uh, the, I mean, the, the, the other spin to it is, you know, it's early, of course, like this is one of the, the first uh, such bridges. It's still a, a technology that's in development and uh, probably things will become safer and there will be uh, other safeguards like insurance and so on that will make losses like, like these um, uh, manageable. But of course, in this case, the insurance came from this uh, this trading firm, uh, Jump Crypto, um, which m maybe a day later, it just yeah, came it was, in. Yeah, it was 24 hours. It, it was 24, 24 hours. hours yeah. Just came in and replaced the $320 million uh, in, in ETH um, uh, back into, into this bridge. And... Yeah, it, it was like a kind of Deus Ex Machina uh, move, uh, which, you know, I, it's it's like, it was a crypto bailout, basically. It was um, a Deus Flex Machina, really, yes. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I don't know, like, crypto, uh, um, Jump Crypto has a, a investments in, um, in, in Solana, in Terra, and, like, in, it, it's invested in a um, cross-chain universe. Uh, and so that's why, you know, they tweeted when when they made this this move, they said uh, it did it because it believes in a multi-chain future. Um, and it didn't want, obviously, their uh, this bridge that they had backed to fail. So um, I don't know what went on, you know, behind the scenes. Like, I don't know what assurances they were given. I thought they just like, you know, they put in 300 million bucks with no strings attached. So that's kind of remains unknown what would happen behind the scenes, but um, in the end, like the, the, the final outcome is that nobody lost money from from this hack. So uh. it, it was like a, a happy ending, but um, I think, you know, I, I don't know if that's going to be the case every time. I mean, likely not, so. Well, the, the, the truth is it, most of the money that was lost was actually theirs. <laughs> so, so make of that what you will. Right. Ash, you must have read this story. Does anything jump out at you from from this? Well, it's easy to follow Cami because I usually agree with her, and I agree with everything that she said there. Just to double click on a couple of points that she made uh, that I think are specifically relevant here. Uh, first, it is obviously we keep saying this for like a broken record. It's very early, but it's very, very, very early in the cross chain space. Uh, this technology is even less mature. Uh, than some of the other technologies in which it's really early. Uh, and then the second point, uh, this idea of, of jump uh, jump capital, uh, jump capital's uh, crypto jump crypto uh, division jumping in and doing this. This is a really interesting sort of idea, this idea that venture capitalists sort of step up into the bridge uh, and throw in you know $320 million of their own capital to backstop an investment uh, that they have. This is something that's very interesting. It's kind of this, this sort of gray area uh, between traditional venture capital on the one hand uh, and decentralized finance on the other. I think that's a really interesting aspect of the story. 
Oh, it absolutely is. It's where, where is the power lying? And if you're a regulator in Congress, how do you look at that? How do you, how do you say, okay, well, actually, no, you make, but you can't stop them because if they want to do that, well, they're going to do that. I have some interesting insight into this because when I was working at Harmony, we were building a bridge and we had a bridge hackathon over the course of a weekend. Three different teams within Harmony tried to build a bridge. They're extremely difficult. Um, firstly, to build a bridge that is permissionless and trustless, those two things together at scale are insanely difficult. Nobody really understands how they work. I had to go deep and figure that stuff out. The problem is when you move value from one place to another, it's like putting a whole bunch of gold bullion in the back of a van and saying, nobody's ever going to hold up the van. It will never happen, but of course it will. What's interesting is that really bridges are a proof of concept and it's a proof of concept for a technology that we don't even need. And so I'm looking further ahead to something called layer zero, which is a technology that simply allows you effectively to pick up the phone, call the person at the other end and say, I attest to the fact that these funds exist and I let, allow this person to use them on the other side. Nothing ever needs to travel. It's simply a form of communication. And because it works at the very, very, very lowest base layer of the blockchain, it's incredibly lightweight as well. So you can send a message extremely quickly. That is where this is going. And that's where all of this could actually work because it's, it's basically impossible to hack it as well. So there is hope for this, but it's, the bridges are a disaster. They're, they're horrific and they will just continue to be attacked because they're so, so very, very vulnerable. There you go. That's my take on it from the inside out. Um, talking about being vulnerable, here's what happens if you tweet something and then five years later, the army of forensic armchair detectives go down and hunt that tweet. And this is what happened to Brantley Milligan. He got canceled. Cami, can you take us through this story? Uh, this is such a fascinating story. So, um, Okay, so Brantley Milligan is, um, he's part of, he, he was part of the uh, ENS uh, organization, um, you know, this uh, organization that allows you to attach um, readable names to uh, blockchain addresses. And in 2016, he had tweeted, uh, where, where is this tweet? Um, okay, so he had tweeted, um, oh, I can't find it. But I have it. Okay. okay. I can read you want, it. You want I can to read, read it? it? So it's, it. if just warning you, if you're easily offended, then just mute now because it's yeah. not great. He says homosexual acts are evil. Transgenderism doesn't yeah. exist. Abortion is murder. Contraception is a perversion. So is masturbation and porn. Yeah. And the date on this one is the 13th of, I think it's May, 2016. Right. Okay. So um, this tweet surfaced. Uh, and obviously a lot of people were offended and called for him to be uh, removed. And um, what happened was that he he holds the, the largest amount of uh, ENS tokens were delegated to him to uh, represent token holders in votes. So um, he was the biggest representative of the ENS community effectively. After this tweet surfaced, um, uh, some token holders started removing their uh, votes uh, to him. Um, but he 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 held that that uh, position as like the the biggest uh, uh, delegate um, until uh, the kind of uh, this like council decided to remove him, like voted to to remove him from from ENS, from his role. Um, the private company employing him also fired him. Um, and, you know, I think like this, this sparked a, a very hard uh, debate, uh, hard in the sense that I think it, it's hard to have like, for me at least, like a black and white view on this. Um, on the one hand, Brantley made those comments because of his beliefs uh, that, you know, he is a conservative Catholic. So, you know, that's why he said homosexual acts are evil, transgenderism doesn't exist, etc. It's It kind of follows his um, religious beliefs. And um, the other thing is, that's why he stood by them. Like, unlike other cases where 
tweet surface about someone and then they apologize they say oh i was young i didn't know or whatever like he stood by by his views um and and i think that's that's fair like people should be able to have their views i think even more so if it's because of their uh, religion like i of course like personally 100 percent disagree with everything he said um you know like i i could not <laughs> kind of ever stand stand by those views but he should be able to i think like there's free speech there's freedom of religion um and he he wasn't um affecting he wasn't uh, uh, imposing those beliefs on anyone on uh on ens right he he it's not like he was like deplatforming him deplatforming um gays from ens or like anything like that um so i i kind of get the view of of people who say you know it's it's free speech it's a it's a free country um and you know he that that shouldn't affect his work and then there's the other side that says well you know he is representing uh he's the biggest representative of uh, ens token holders he's at the face of this company uh and this uh, protocol uh this project um wants to represent uh, an inclusive uh, community it doesn't want to uh, hurt anyone or single people out so it's not sustainable to have a person with views that are so different from the community that he is uh, representing um my personal take is that if that's the case then then i think that they should have let the market play out you know if 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 you were offended with um with brantley's views and you didn't want him to represent you then you should um you should have taken your uh, token uh, delegation away from him um and the market would have not like naturally uh, made him you know step step down in in representation like he, he would have naturally become uh, gone from the the, the highest uh, delegate to the, the one of the the delegates with the lowest amount amount of votes but um, instead of that, they there was a, a vote of like I think it was like five people, uh, but like a very small number of people who voted to remove him. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, he was cancelled. He was cancelled. Straight up cancelled. Yeah. It that makes me. I I, I wish like they th that I wish there was like I wish token holders would have um, made that decision rather than a just like closed council of people. You know, if, if people w choose to not have Brantley represent them, that's 100% fair and in their right. Um, and some, like, that was in the process of happening. Um, but there was just, like, not enough time for that to play out before he was, like, cancelled. So, and the last thing I I'll say is I think what's dangerous about this is it may just set this precedent that, you know, whenever people don't agree with something someone says, uh, as long as there's this kind of uh, big group of people coming uh, against someone, um, then it, it's going to be a matter of time before they get removed from, from their position. And today it happened that, you know, probably everyone here in this call and, and, and probably the majority of people um, disagree with with what he said, and it's fine. But what happens when the thing that you stand for is what is being called out? Um, so I don't know. I, I think you know it's it's a very kind of U.S. centric take as well. This kind of cancel culture, and I think people in the U.S. can be more um, like. Um, maybe yeah. not see the gravity of this because they they haven't been in in a position um of more repressive regimes where being cancelled has like extremely dire consequences um so anyways i i would i would think that this this can be just like a very dangerous precedent to set and it, it can be a slippery slope ash what, what are your thoughts on this one because it 
from my side, it looks like a failure of the governance process as we've been kind of holding it up as this thing that we do. But I'm curious what, what your thoughts are on it. Well, you know, I was thinking about this a little bit more broadly in terms of the technology. and What happens when uh, we get to a point where governance is going to be, uh, obviously, in this case, there's the capacity of delegates to switch. Uh, but what happens when there's a protocol, uh, for example, when someone says something uh, that a large group of people think uh, is highly offensive, uh, and then uh, you have effectively them controlling a, a large proportion of the governance tokens. They can't be removed or fired as you would uh, from, for example, an employer. This is a conversation that we've been having since probably about 2017 here in the United States. But what happens with version 2.0 of this when someone uh, says something? I, I just don't know where that shakes out. And it's going to be a really interesting world uh, when we get there to see uh, when effectively uh, you, you have the properties of math and physics protecting your ownership and governance rights in a particular protocol. What happens next? Or I guess the, the potential is uh, for forks and splits. This is a really interesting concept, and I think we're going to see it play out, uh, unfortunately, almost certainly in this space. Well, what, what you're seeing in our space at the moment is that there is this growing awareness that weight in governance matters. And so there are kind of all these governance wars going on at the protocol level where projects attempt to, to gain an oversized amount of a governance token, for instance, in Curve, to have a, a massive influence over where the rewards in that protocol go to, but also in, in, in saying what happens there. I think the interesting parallel for me this week was Joe Rogan and his podcast, Spotify, and Spotify's actions around that. And it was a really brutal thing that happened, like, you know, nine years of podcasts, and every time you said the N-word, it's resurfaced. And like, we know that, like, in, in podcasts, you say stuff in the heat of the moment it comes out. And of course, there is an editing process and all of that. But yeah, he, he, it was brutal. And so if that podcast was a Web3 podcast and it was owned by a community of governance holders, would they just get rid of him? And where where does the debate lie? You know, that and, and I think what's what's hard here is where is the room for someone to put their hand up and say sorry? In Brandy's case, he didn't. He He didn't walk it back at all. But we tend to overreact and, and have a knee-jerk reaction to things and then kind of allow outrage to decide whether where we put our vote. And it, it just becomes this echo chamber of, 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 of ideas and thoughts. And it would just be so counterproductive to everything that we're actually trying to do if we allowed that to become the, the normal. So I, I, I think it's... This? What, what are the consequences uh, of people constantly being recorded on video and audio all of the time? Uh, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I certainly am pleased, relieved uh, that there isn't a lot of video out there from when I was, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old. You know, you have kids who are growing up today uh, in this environment where it's just completely saturated with permanent records uh, of these things that they're saying. And this idea that someone's going to go for a job interview at 25 or 30 and someone's going to drag out something that they said when they were 15 or 16 years old and here's the video, man, that's going to be an uncomfortable conversation to have. Well, we're also looking at these brand new social network concepts that are coming out on the blockchain, which is like your comments get turned into NFTs and they get committed to the blockchain and then they are there and they're attached forever to your profile. Now, there's two ways to look at this, one of which is you're screwed and you self-censor to avoid any kind of you know backlash on things that, are that you've said or might have said. That might actually be a good thing. Or you say, well, actually, the threat of that will force people to be a little bit nicer. I don't know where where it lands, but I know that there's definitely there's some there's, there's yeah I've got kids I'm going to teach them how to use the internet properly, and that means that they will won't ever use it probably. <laughs> it's horrifying, but we're we're in the middle of this and we have to figure it out because who else is going to figure it out? Uh, I tell you what though, if we're talking bad actors, what a what a what a beautiful way to end the show. The Bitfinex hack, $3.6 billion in Bitcoin that the US government was trumpeting loudly that they had recovered. What a story this was. Cami, can you walk us through it? Yeah, okay. So um, Bitfinex was hacked in 2016 for what 120, about 120,000 Bitcoin, which at the time was worth about $71 million. Of course, since then, Bitcoin has skyrocketed um, and that stash is now worth 3.6 billion. So what happened this week was that a couple that had their hands on this Bitcoin, um, it's not clear whether they were the actual hackers, but they were they had this Bitcoin on their hands and they were in the process of laundering it um, and they were caught. 
uh, in that process. And um, I think like a couple of things to say. One, you guys should take a look at uh, the the woman behind this because she is just something. <laughs> um, she she she's Explain. a rapper. Explain. <laughs> Her, her, he just, she just like has this really kind of flamboyant and goofy uh, character, like persona online. Um, and yeah, she's just this like a uh, rapper artist. I don't know. It's it's just like very. It's not like the type of person that you would expect would be laundering hundred and twenty thousand worth of Bitcoin. I'll say that. So that was just like a, a, a funny kind of side note of this whole uh, story. Um, and then I guess like the other takeaway is uh, it just like puts another dent to that argument that um, Bitcoin is for criminals. Uh, right now, the FBI and, uh, and lawmakers and regulators, uh, they have become really, really sophisticated in tracking down illegal uh, activity. And, um, you know, actually, uh, as always, cash is the safest way for uh, criminals to uh, transact. Having a, a, a permanent record on chain, both for social media and for illegal uh, <laughs> uh, uh, transfers, is not kind of the, the easiest way to go. And this case uh, proves it, like, these guys, Imagine just like holding on to billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin for years and, you know, waiting to finally kind of use it and, and then being caught like the minute they start moving their funds. So, um, yeah. Well, I mean, I think you put it correctly. The, this is Ilya Lichtenstein and Heather Morgan. Heather Morgan hilariously wrote for Forbes. And uh, the title of one of her articles was Experts Share Tips to Protect Your Businesses from Cyber Criminals. And this is Heather R. Morgan, economist, serial entrepreneur, SaaS investor, and rapper. And then we've, we, when we look at her rapping, oh my good God, if you were going to write a show about all the idiots in blockchain, this is what it would look like. You would, would, you would just parody everything that's bad about this space, and it would look like that. And, it, and here we are, it's real. You couldn't make this up. What I want to know is how on earth they could afford to buy these Bitcoins in the first place. Where did, where did that come from? And then just like, the best part of all of this is Michael Saylor coming out and tweeting, the US has billions in Bitcoin on its balance sheet. Uh, those files contain the private keys required to access the digital wallet that directly received the funds stolen from Bitfinex and allowed special agents to lawfully seize and recover more than 94,000 Bitcoin that had been stolen from Bitfinex. You just imagine Michael going, hey, boys, welcome to the club. How's it feel? <laughs> Ash, well, what do you make of it? Well, you know, to, to echo Cammy's point, I think it's incredibly important to know uh, precisely what she said about this idea that, that Bitcoin is for criminals. Clearly, uh, cash, euro, other paper currencies, banknotes, much better for facilitating transactions that are illicit. You can see clearly U.S. law enforcement, federal law enforcement, very sophisticated in how they're tracking these crimes. Two additional points. I know it's easy to get caught up uh, in the raps and the rhymes here. Uh, but important to say, of course, innocent until proven guilty. They've been charged but not convicted of any crime. Uh, and second, to me, reading the criminal complaint, well, the thing that jumped out at me, uh, and Cammy touched on this, which is this idea that they were not charged uh, with actually committing the theft. They were charged with conspiracy to launder the illicit proceeds of the theft. To me, this story uh, is something that we're going to have to continue to watch. I suspect that there are more shoes to drop here. I think this is very early on uh, in the story, and it's going to be interesting to see where it goes next. Well, the one that jumps out is, of course, Quadriga. The Quadriga went bust his Canadian crypto exchange, and with it, a ton of Bitcoin has just disappeared. Nobody knows where it is, and will we see it just turn up somewhere on the black market in three or four years' time? I mean, I the, the truth is the, the second largest hack of Bitcoin uh, in history, 120,000 coins. I think Mt. Gox was about 140,000. This uh, predates Mt. Gox by about three years. This was 2016, Mt. Gox was 2019. But it's a huge amount of coins. The total amount, uh, the uh, total amount of value outstanding on this hack, I believe, is over $5 billion now, of which $3.6 billion were recovered uh, by federal law enforcement, which we found out about yesterday, Rob. Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. It was one of my favorite stories of the last week. Um, Cami, is there anything you're looking forward to in the week ahead as we wrap this up? I think, like, 
going back to the beginning, um, the like price action has been super surprising. Uh, I think we were all kind of getting ready to uh, go hibernate in a long market and suddenly everything's awake again and we're maybe the bulls are back um so I, i'll be watching and seeing kind of where where we go uh, should i should i go back into the cave or should i put on the horns <laughs> one never goes into the cave one always stays <laughs> out in the open where one can be attacked yeah. relentlessly ash mm -hmm. I, I know you you watch the markets is there anything you're looking at for specifically so I, as always, am going to be watching price action. Uh, I'm also going to be continuing to watch the story we were just talking about. Let me just throw one more out there that I found amusing, uh, which was the Decentraland wedding. Uh, this is kind of a funny, silly story, but it's also a glimpse into the future. This couple uh, got married uh, in Decentraland. Uh, apparently, it was a comedy of errors. There were server problems. The NFT party favors ran out. Uh, I'm going to quote F. Scott Fitzgerald. The test of a truly first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed uh, ideas in the mind uh, without losing the ability to function. On the one hand, boy, this seems like it's really silly. On the other hand, I suspect that we're going to be seeing a lot more of this uh, type of activity, whether it's weddings, funerals, this idea that our lives are moving into the metaverse. Uh, it's something that's going to happen, and it's something that's going to be an interesting and I think really compelling place to watch, Robin. Yeah, absolutely. Well, my, my my investigations this week went into a project called Lens Protocol, which is from other one of the, the kind of major blue chip DeFi protocols, and they released a version of Facebook's social graph, but a decentralized version of it. So rather than trying to upend Facebook and Twitter and everything else, what they said is, we're going to decentralize this social graph upon which all of these services are built and allow you to build your service on top of that. That's the first time I've seen that idea being put together. And for me, that and the mycelial network that it creates, that is the, the the bedrock of what will be the metaverse in its fleshed out, beautiful form. I think we just become so used to seeing video games and you know high production value CGI in, in movies that we forget that underneath it, you actually need to have the script, the story, the thing that makes it all possible. And that is what Lens Protocol, I think, could be the beginnings of. But I'm going to hold judgment on that till I see an actual app on it. But that's going to come soon, and maybe we'll all be using that instead of Twitter, which would be interesting. And of course, social truth, uh, Trump's social network is is about to launch or may launch or may not launch, who knows if the App Store bans it. But uh, a show that won't be banned for next week is this one. So join us next week for more of the same from myself, Cami, Ash, thanks for joining us. And we will see you next week at the same time. Thank you. Goodbye.